As Carsten said, today I'm going to focus uh, on discussing uh, mostly dimensionality reduction, but as you will see, you will also see quite a bit of the more traditional uh, uh, machine learning uh, kind of techniques. Uh, the idea being uh, that in order for a dimensionality reduction algorithm to uh, you know, to, to be informative, you, it should also be able to predict uh, the structure property relation in your material. And uh, you will see really how the, the two things go hand in hand, being able to, uh, op to obtain, uh, you know, uh, generally applicable and uh, accurate predictions of the properties of your material is in a certain sense a guarantee that the um, correlations and the, and, and, and the clusters and the families of compounds that will be um, highlighted by a dimensionality reduction or some sort of unsupervised learning technique um, is basically, you know, we guarantee that these correlations are actually meaningful. So uh, before I start, uh, I want to say that, I mean, I, I will not get, get too much into the technical details because I don't think that one hour is enough to really get you uh, completely from that point of view, but I will try more to present you examples from uh, uh, papers that have we, uh, and work that we have been doing, uh, and the main people who are responsible for this work uh, are Sean, Deep, Felix, and Andrea, and I just wanted to make sure that their uh, contribution is properly acknowledged. So, um, generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the, the problem that we want to solve here, if you, if, if you, if you wish, uh, is that of representing a large amount of high dimensional data. And these two things really go hand in hand, because if you have a large amount of data, but you know already from uh, some, uh, uh, you know, some magic, uh, or, uh, that you have uh, a simple way of uh, um, reduce the complexity of this data to a few uh, principal uh, components, principal directions, uh, then uh, even if you have uh, uh, tens of millions of configurations, uh, uh, they really do not express that much variety. No? And you can use the knowledge of this low dimensional uh, representation to simplify the you know, just the, quantitative, uh, the quantitatively large amount of data points uh, just by, by exploiting the fact uh, that you have uh, um, knowledge of the low dimensionality of the, of, of the data itself. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that this doesn't ring uh, while we are talking. So um, generally speaking, uh, I have been interested in uh, machine learning techniques, broadly speaking, uh, for quite a few years now, but I must admit that, I mean, I have been showing this slide around for quite a bit, and, and, and my typical uh, uh, story here was saying that, uh, that, that basically, okay, we have this large amount of data that is available in uh, materials databases, not to mention if you're doing uh, more chemically oriented kind of research, cheminformatics have been generating a huge uh, databases of, of possible chemicals uh, uh, for, for several decades now. Uh, and I've always been saying that, okay, you know, you can try to use a computer to learn something from this data, and most of the traditional um, machine learning approaches uh, sort of try to use this data to predict some properties of this data. So basically to use uh, knowledge of the properties of a certain subset of all of the potential uh, materials uh, to interpolate uh, and predict uh, the properties of uh, sidestepping uh, an expensive quantum mechanical calculation. And I'm sure, uh, I mean, having seen the list of speakers and the titles of talks, uh, that you have seen many of these kind of uh, applications this far. And at this point I used to say that I'm actually more interested in trying to extract some more intuitive understanding from uh, the data and without necessarily trying to predict the properties, but just, for instance, classifying a large amount of uh, complicated structures into classes automatically. And what I've come to realize is that actually these two things really go hand in hand. And I will I, I will really try to show you, uh, you know, predictions of materials properties, but at each time I try to show you how from uh, 
the, per, the operation of performing this prediction, you can understand something about the material on a deeper physical level. So um, in general terms, I think that in order to apply uh, data-driven approaches to the characterization of large amounts of materials data, uh, you have to work uh, in a sort of a multi-scale fashion. So you have first uh, to realize uh, that, generally speaking, uh, uh, the way our brain uh, is built to, um, you know, to, to, to find patterns and, and, and recognize correlations builds on identifying patterns. And if you think about it, uh, most of the um, hand-waving explanation of the properties of materials always relies on saying uh, we have a hydrogen bond, we have secondary structure in polypeptides, uh, we have uh, octahedra in perovskite materials whose orientation drives uh, uh, electronic and magnetic transitions. So really, a first ingredient in uh, any approach that tries to understand materials from a purely uh, data-driven approach has somehow to rely on a pattern recognition engine that can identify patterns that involve just a few atoms. So the idea here is that once you come up with a more or less abstract way of describing a chemical environment, uh, then uh, you can just look at a molecular dynamic simulation, for instance, uh, and look uh, at the probability of observing each of these patterns uh, based on this abstract uh, pattern description. And then uh, this probability is basically going to tell you something about the free energetic stability of different motifs. Uh, and then uh, you will be able to build uh, a fingerprint that can uh, identify these patterns in new materials uh, with some sort of probabilistic foundation. So that can tell you, mm, I am 90% uh, sure that this is actually uh, the pattern that I'm seeing. N and you know, after having started to do this, uh, you quickly realize that one of the big challenges uh, is, uh, uh, is actually the, this abstract description. So you know, trying to avoid putting into your uh, initial, uh, you know, in, into your prior assumption, the way you describe environment, uh, try to avoid to put already uh, your preconceived idea of what should be the important motives that you are looking for. And, and, uh, and I will spend quite some time dis uh, discussing uh, um, general purpose and abstract way of comparing uh, environments and structures. And finally, uh, when you are dealing with a material which is really complex, uh, and for instance, any, pretty much anything uh, in, in biology has this, uh, this, this property, um, you, it's typically built up of many of these individual subunits. So these atomic sp scale patterns that you have recognized, you will have uh, tens or hundreds of these, uh, and they will uh, interact with each other in an untrivial way. And every time you have a problem like this, uh, this is the kind of situations in which you need dimensionality reduction. Because you will, in order to fully describe your system, you will need uh, to specify the state uh, of tens or hundreds of these motifs. Uh, and then the only way you can obtain a representation which you can basically put on a, piece, uh, on a set of slides and uh, discuss uh, in front of a coffee or a beer is to be able to represent this complicated high dimensional space uh, on a piece of paper. And uh, I will give you some examples of the kind of things that you can do with this dimensionality reduction techniques. So let me start with a very, very simple, very concrete example. How do we get around to uh, defining what is a hydrogen bond in a purely data driven fashion? Okay? So, People have been, uh, chemists in particular, have been debating about what is a hydrogen bond and what is a, uh, you know, a good definition of what a hydrogen bond is for decades, if not centuries. And, but if you think about it, uh, ultimately, uh, a hydrogen bond is just an arrangement of three atoms, uh, two electronegative one and a hydrogen. And so three distances uh, uh, characterize completely the geometry of a hydrogen bond. And in fact, uh, uh, typically the, you know, the heuristic definitions of hydrogen bonds that you find in the literature all uh, rely on uh, combinations of these distances uh, and on basically defining uh, a, a region in the, in the space defined by these three distances or, or by function of them uh, that you decide 
characterizes a hydrogen bond. And for instance, if you take one of the typical definitions, uh, bond and angle definitions, and you look at the pair correlation function of water, so you know, here I'm sitting on a water molecule and asking myself, what is the probability of finding oxygen in a certain position? Basically, you see that you have a very, very high peaks in the probability distribution, and the typical heuristic definitions do nothing but uh, encircling uh, this, uh, uh, this peak. So the question is, uh, can we find uh, this peak and use the exact location of this peak to define what's a hydrogen bond? And, and, and the idea here is that we first run a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, that you know, we make a leap of faith uh, and we assume it's an uh, accurate representation of the behavior of the system. And then uh, we look uh, at all possible groups of oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, and look at what's the value of these three distances and basically build a three-dimensional histogram. Once you do that, you can identify the maxima and just say each maximum is uh, an important pattern. And I mean, one could go about and also discuss what the other part, uh, you know, the other maxima mean. But basically, it is this lobe of the distribution which corresponds to the set of distances that people typically associate with the hydrogen bond. And basically, this would be the definition that arises from this kind of procedure. And you see, it follows precisely uh, the maximum in the probability distribution. So the point is that you can do much more than this. So this, in a, if you want, this was a relatively uh, trivial exercise. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not useless because, for instance, it gives you a definition that will adapt uh, to, the, uh, you know, to the description of the hydrogen bond in your model. So if you change the functional that you're using to model water, the definition of what is a hydrogen bond will change. And that's correct because a different functional will have a different uh, relative free energy of different portions, and you don't have to fine tune manually these, uh, you know, length and angle parameters. It will tell you exactly for that functional and that set of thermodynamic conditions what is the most reasonable definition of a hydrogen bond. However, you can try to do more. And for instance, you can try to attack problems that are not so trivial. So for instance, if you look at a water wire, this is just a one-dimensional chain of water molecules that you can take as a simplified model of what's going on, for instance, in fuel cell proton exchange membranes or in, a, or in the channel in a, you know, in a aquaporin in some sort of membrane protein. Uh, and you add an excess proton, so you have an H plus uh, in excess. Uh, it becomes actually very hard, uh, even uh, by high, even by looking at the, at, the, at the trajectory, to say precisely where is this excess proton. Because this excess proton becomes a delocalized entity that doesn't sit at any time on a precise water molecule. So you can try to identify where the proton is, and you can do that by using the electronic structure as well. So what you can do is you run uh, uh, your uh, ab initio molecular dynamic simulation, and then you compute Vanier centers. Uh, those of you who don't know what a Vanier center is, basically uh, a modern version uh, of a Lewis pair. So that's a simplified way of localizing electrons uh, and uh, associating uh, a point to each pair of electrons. And then if you look at a hydrogen bond, you see that typically the two, uh, you know, the, uh, the Vanier centers around the hy uh, oxygen atom uh, uh, belong to two categories. Uh, you have those that sit halfway between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and these are basically the bonds. And two more that sit uh, closer to the oxygen, and basically these represent the lone pairs. So if you look at the distribution of, uh, uh, you know, of these uh, uh, Vanier centers around the uh, oxygen atom, you find that typically, on a typical neutral water molecule, you have two that are at 0 0.3 and two that are at 0 0.5. However, when you add an excess proton, a second maximum develops in the probability distribution for these distances, which corresponds to a symmetric distribution of Vanier centers. So these are Vanier centers that are nor flesh nor fish. They are not bonds and they're not lone pairs. They are a signature of the proton that is traversing uh, your water wire. And you can 
partition this probability distribution and use it basically to identify the position of the proton in a probabilistic manner. And basically, you know, this gives you an automatically an index that goes between zero neutral water to one water bearing a proton. And you can see this uh, going around. So both of these examples uh, give you an idea of the kind of uh, uh, patterns that you can be looking for into a simulation of a material or a complicated biomolecule. Uh, in both cases, however, I mean, uh, you will have, uh, you might have recognized that I was actually putting a lot of uh, prior knowledge and prior understanding in my definition of uh, what a pattern might have been. I mean, the procedure with which I look for this second maximum means that I have already looked at the system for a long time and I have picked the true order parameters that clearly, I mean, in my own uh, understanding, must be the important ones. So at this point, I started to realize that what I needed was actually something more general and less uh, informed by my prior knowledge about the system. Uh, and then I think it's important uh, to have this uh, sort of slide, uh, which is very um, abstract and mathematical. But the, the idea is that really uh, the, in, the object that I need is something which is capable of measuring the distance between two structures. So the, uh, this, this is a notion which is much easier to understand and to develop than actually uh, you know, finding fingerprints that identify one structure. You know, finding a finite number of collective variables uh, that identify the state of my system. And so effectively, all that we need, uh, as you will see, to, um, as the in basic ingredient to build uh, a, a machine learning scheme to, to find, do automatically this kind of analysis, is a distance that can tell me if two items in a set are similar or very different. And actually, I will use a little bit interchangeably the notion of a fingerprint, the notion of a distance, and the notion of a kernel. And at this point, uh, you have heard probably already the word kernel several times during these two weeks. Uh, but from all practical purposes, all that I care about is the notion that a kernel is a function that, you know, it's I mean, it tends to a finite value when the two structures are very similar, and it tends to zero when the two structures are very different. And uh, you know, a typical, you always have a, a, a mapping between a positive definite kernel and a distance, and vice versa. And actually, if you can define a distance and or a kernel, it's also very easy to the to define data-driven fingerprints. And this is not something that I'm going to uh, discuss very much in detail. But uh, uh, it's, it's basically the mathematical foundation of all of these machine learning schemes that are based on kernels. So uh, how do you define uh, a kernel function that can uh, compare two structures? Uh, and here, my objective is really to make this uh, construction as general as possible. So I don't want to be using, uh, I don't know, um, the, uh, the, the, a graph representation of the bonds within my structure, because perhaps uh, my structure will be an ionic crystal for which I cannot define clearly bonds. Uh, meant as copolent bonds. So I really want a completely general scheme. And I think that the, one of the most effective ways to, uh, to, to, to build something which is general purpose is actually uh, you know, to change the focus. Uh, and rather than looking at a way to compare structure, uh, focus on a way to compare atomic environments. In a certain sense, this is something that really builds onto the intuition of electronic structure theory that you can uh, you know, the, that electronic matter is nearsighted, so that you can, uh, when you have a large system, you can break it down in local uh, pieces, and each piece makes sense in its own, and the properties of, it, of the different pieces can then be pasted together. And so basically what I will show you is how you can start by a kernel that only tells you whether two groups of atoms are similar or different uh, to each other, and uh, combine these uh, into um, a kernel that you can use to match um, entire structures or entire molecules. 
So how can you do this? Uh, you have had uh, a presentation by, uh, by Gabor earlier uh, that went into very much detail about uh, the definition of this uh, smooth overlap uh, of atomic positions. Uh, uh, just as a reminder, the basic idea is that you sit on, a, on, the two, uh, on the two atoms that you want to compare, I mean, whose environments you want to compare. You deploy Gaussian hills on each of the atoms around your center. Then uh, you overlap the centers, uh, and you compute the, uh, you know, the overlap integral between the two um, Gaussian densities. Actually, as you will see later on, uh, uh, I really think that one should think of these uh, densities more as probability amplitudes, because then uh, this overlap integral becomes something which is really equivalent to a scalar product between two wave functions. So I think that this sort of reveals uh, some uh, uh, analogy between this way of comparing two environments uh, and uh, um, some sort of quantum mechanical description of the system. Then, uh, I mean, uh, this, you, you, if you remember uh, uh, Gabor's presentation, uh, you have to do a, a number of different operations to make sure that actually this overlap integral uh, satisfies the fundamental symmetries uh, of, of the problem. But I will not get into detail. Th to me, this is just a very smart way of comparing two groups of atoms. And the real question is, once you have done this operation, how can you build something that you can use to compare entire structures? So a simple thing that you can do is say, OK, I mean, I can do this for each pair of environments. So I can sit on each of the atoms in structure A and in structure B and compute the this similarity kernel between this environment and this environment, this environment and this environment, and so on and so forth. And then I can build the, uh, the compound, the global kernel, by combining together in some way these uh, uh, individual kernels. And you can do this in different ways. So a way that would seem very intuitively uh, a good one is basically to try to find uh, you know, to match one-to-one uh, -one the environments in the two structures uh, and find uh, the combination that maximizes this kernel. Another possible way, which is simple-minded but actually works beautifully, and I explain you why, uh, is you just say, I put everything together, you know, without caring whether the match is good or bad. I just average all over all of the possible pairings. And Something that actually we find works particularly well, uh, as it is often the case, uh, is basically a technique that allows you to interpolate between these two extremes. So it's, it looks mathematically complicated, but it's actually cheaper to do than uh, this, uh, this matching. Um, and the idea is that basically you do something which is some sort of maximization, which is, however, regularized uh, with the uh, information entropy of this matching matrix. And depending uh, of, you know, if you set this to zero, you recover this limit. If you set this parameter to infinity, you recover the, you know, the un unbiased average uh, limit. OK, so I mean. What does it mean to pick one choice over another? Uh, so I mean, what does it mean actually physically to do something like this? I mean, this seems like an operation which is very uh, uh, unnatural. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting together information on, uh, I don't know, perhaps the similarity between uh, a, hydrogen, a, a carbon atom, which is sp1 uh, uh, hybridized and one which is as before. Does it really make sense? Well, actually, you can show that formally, uh, if you build, uh, and this you have seen, uh, uh, this is basically an expression for a kernel ridge regression, uh, machine, lear ex uh, machine learning of the energy. So if I write the energy or a certain property of a molecule A as a weighted sum of kernels between my structure and uh, a number of reference structures, uh, and they build this kernel as just uh, a uh, unweighted, uh, uh, just a plain average of all the possible kernels, uh, you can show that this is equivalent uh, to assuming that your energy function can be broken down in uh, you know, atom-centered energies. So there is basically uh, 
a correspondence between uh, taking the simplest possible uh, um, form of combination in building uh, your global kernel and, uh, in a certain sense, the simplest possible expression for, uh, um, for energy of uh, an extended system, which is breaking it down in atom-centered contributions. Okay? So this is actually, I mean, this can be a complicated many-body uh, kind of expansion, eh? because I mean, uh, this is just saying that the energy on a certain atom will be an arbitrarily complicated function of the positions of all the atoms around it. However, uh, you are making this assumption of basically additivity, which is something that helps tremendously in learning any property for which you can assume that it will be additive. So something like this, for instance, will fail catastrophically if you try to learn a band gap. But it will work extremely well if you try to learn the total energy, because the total energy is something that can sort of be decomposed in uh, subsystems. Uh, something like the band gap is something instead that requires knowledge of the entire Hamiltonian. And actually, I will show you one example, not concerning band gaps, uh, that using uh, this uh, sort of entropy regularization that goes beyond uh, additive uh, uh, combination of the kernels uh, is one way to learn properties that don't decompose naturally into atom-centered uh, contributions. So now I just want to give you a few examples of how you can use these uh, to machine learn properties. And uh, the reason why I want to show this uh, is that for each example, I will also be able to show you how, uh, from the successes and the failures uh, of the learning uh, operation, uh, you can learn something uh, about uh, the physics uh, that underlies your system. So for instance, uh, let's take what is one of the national uh, sports in the uh, machine learning community, which is learning the energies uh, of the GDB9 uh, uh, database, which is an <laughs> extremely useful uh, uh, test, uh, you know, benchmark database that have been put together um, by I mean, by several people, uh, in, uh, many of which are or have been in Berlin. Um, and, uh, and basically, so one, one aspect that we tried to do when doing this exercise was actually to make sure that we were making something useful. In this sense, uh, so this database in itself uh, contains a bunch of DFT-optimized geometries uh, and the associated ground state energies. And the typical benchmark exercise, and I will show some of these benchmarks later on, is to learn the DFT energy starting, uh, taking as an input uh, the DFT optimized geometry. Now, this is clearly uh, a pointless exercise, because in order to get the DFT optimized geometry, I needed to run a DFT calculation. So actually, we also did two other things, uh, which were basically we starting from knowledge of the DFT geometry predict the uh, couple cluster energy. And uh, much more challenging, uh, uh, starting from knowledge of the geometry optimized uh, at a semi-empirical level, uh, predict uh, directly the couple cluster energy for the DFT geometry. So basically, we never, I mean, these guys have done the DFT optimizations, so we have the reference values, uh, but in the test exercise, I pretend that I don't know the DFT geometries, and I directly predict the optimized energy starting from a non-optimized geometry. So what you can see, so you, you have probably seen many of these again. This is a learning curve, which basically shows you how the error in the prediction decreases as I add more and more molecules to the training set for my problem. And, and basically, you can see how, uh, OK, you can predict directly uh, the couple cluster energies uh, getting to an error below a kilocalorie per mole. But actually, if you exploit the fact that you know already the DFT energies, and this is something which is uh, well known, you can actually bring down the error to virtually zero. And what is interesting uh, is that uh, um, well, first of all, you can get pretty good predictions even just using the semi-empirical geometries. Uh, but what is interesting is how actually you get down. So here what I'm doing is I basically use as input uh, 20,000 structures. Uh, 
okay, for which I have done both PM7 uh, geometry optimizations uh, and the DFT optimizations. And I learn from all of them, uh, trying to understand how I can predict the couple cluster energy. What I've done in this curve uh, has been uh, using uh, for only these 20,000 train structures uh, information on how much uh, the PM7 optimization went wrong. So basically, I am discarding uh, the structures uh, for which uh, uh, the PM7 geometry was very different from the DFT geometry. When I'm testing, uh, I don't use this information. So there will be some of the structures in the test set uh, for which PM7 uh, would fail badly. And I don't know. I'm not using this information. But just the fact of discarding uh, the structures for which I know that something is going wrong uh, uh, improves dramatically the accuracy of my predictions. And, 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 and this, in my opinion, is important because it gives you an example of how sensitive uh, machine learning is uh, uh, to problems in your training set. So as soon as you have some inconsistencies, as soon as you have some structures uh, computed at a different level of theory or with a different number of k points, uh, or you have uh, some structures for which the underlying assumptions of the approximate method fail, uh, your machine learning is going to take a very, very hard uh, hit. And uh, to me, this is one of you, I will return to this later, consistency check of, on uh, databases that go into machine learning models uh, is extremely important because machine learning models are extremely sensitive to inconsistencies. And then, I mean, I, I just want to show you a little bit uh, what the, you know, the limit of accuracy that you can reach uh, with uh, uh, this kind of techniques. So for instance, uh, using this uh, scheme uh, and using, uh, you know, here we stopped at 20,000 structures uh, because, uh, I mean, computing couple cluster energies uh, is expensive even for small molecules. But if you restrict yourself to the, you know, academic exercise of learning DFT starting from DFT, we can push it up to 100,000 and we bring the error down uh, to, uh, to basically a kilojoule per mole. Um, and, and actually, on a smaller data set, uh, you can try to play different games uh, and try to learn something about chemistry by checking how different benchmarks work. So if you just apply this same scheme that I discussed this far to this smaller uh, data set that only contains 7,000 structures, uh, we get down to, some, to a number like this. So it's half a kilocalorie per mole error, which is, I mean, it's less than, uh, it's, it's basically 50% less than what was the state of the art. But you can do much better than this. And how can you do better? Well, you can learn a lot from how you can do better. So in the construction of this, uh, um, of the overlap integrals that enter these uh, soap kernels, uh, you normally assume uh, that only, you know, that you only overlap oxygen with oxygen, sulfur with sulfur, carbon with carbon, and hydrogen with hydrogen. However, you can generalize the framework, uh, and basically you say, okay, to each of these probability amplitudes that correspond to oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and so on, I also associate uh, a little bit like a spinor, no? I associate uh, an abstract uh, cat that describes the chemical nature of uh, the different elements. And then when you formally take this overlap, uh, you don't need to make this overlap uh, uh, between these uh, spinor-like components uh, uh, orthogonal. You can take any form you like. And here, for instance, we tried something very naive, which is just taking these, uh, these sort of uh, uh, alchemical overlap object to be the difference in electronic, uh, Gaussian function of the difference in electronegativity. And uh, you know, just doing this uh, brings down the error by 20%, which at this level is not little accomplishment. What, what do we learn from this? Uh, well, we learn uh, the, what chemists have known uh, since uh, before polling, uh, which is the fact that, that different elements uh, behave in similar ways. And if you include this information you know, in, the, in, the, in the making of your machine learning algorithm, you can gain a substantial amount of accuracy. 
And of course, there is a lot of potential, and we are playing around uh, with different ways of optimizing these uh, matrix elements, uh, not only because we can make the algorithm more accurate, uh, but also because uh, the optimal uh, elements uh, can also give us uh, some sort of uh, purely data-driven uh, defini redefinition of electronegativity, in a certain sense. Another very important aspect uh, that, you know, we keep uh, he hearing about, but I, I had never seen in such a clear way, is the uh, scale of chemical interaction. So what's the length scale uh, at which, uh, I mean, what, what is the energy scale associated with interactions at a certain length scale? So what you can try to do, for instance, is to, since we have a definition that is based on local environments, we can cut off these local environments at different levels. And what happens, in my opinion, is very, very instructive. So if you use an extremely short cutoff, Chu Ongstrom, uh, so in the definition of the environment, we use a, def a length scale of only Chu Ongstrom. What happens is that initially, this kernel, when you have just a few training structures, works extremely well. Why? It works extremely well because there is a small amount of information in a sphere of Chu Ongstrom. And so with just a few structures, you can cover a lot of the potential uh, configurations. However, as you keep pushing to larger number of training structures uh, and uh, lower error, at a certain point, uh, you sort of saturate. Why are you saturating? You're saturating because uh, the information on the residual is encoded in, l in longer range interactions. And indeed, uh, a kernel with a longer uh, cutoff does better when you increase the number of training structures. And I mean, we did this also on the larger GDB9 data set. And there, you see that when you really push to large, uh, larger and larger number of training structures, uh, the even longer length scales become important when you want to push the accuracy below, let's say, uh, the, the half kilocalorie per mole. And so, you know, here we learn something about the scale of chemical interactions. Uh, and you can use this uh, information to actually make the learning more efficient. Uh, and you can build a kernel, which is a combination of uh, multiple kernels. Uh, and this basically gives you consistently back their accuracy across the board. Uh, and uh, we ben basically can push the error down to a quarter of a kilocalorie per mole. So another example, you can also use uh, these, uh, and this is data from Karsten, actually. So you can use uh, this uh, scheme to machine learn the energy differences between different levels of electronic structure theory. Now, I could you know, quote again uh, the fantastic accuracy we get, uh, basically, uh, for we, we can start uh, from uh, GGA, uh, GGA and predict couple cluster level accuracy uh, with just 20 uh, training structures. Um, I mean, here it's a very simple problem. We just have different conformers of glucose. Still, uh, with just 20 reference structures, we can bring, uh, we can basically get couple cluster level accuracy uh, with only 20 references and just running DFT. However, I want to point you at the, uh, you know, at the insight that you gain by this exercise. So this is a figure that contains a lot of information. So bear with me. On the upper triangular side, I'm showing you the intrinsic discrepancy between two techniques. So you see that basically semi-empiricals have a very large error compared to anything which contains uh, uh, exact exchange or uh, post artifact terms. Uh, and, and you see that there is a very considerable improvement when you go from plain GGAs uh, to uh, hybrid uh, functionals. However, if you look uh, at the lower triangle, which is showing you the error after you apply the machine learning correction, uh, you see that basically there isn't much difference between GGA and hybrids. So what is tell uh, this is telling us effectively is that Ha the, the correction uh, that comes from, uh, the, 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 from exact exchange uh, is very easy to machine learn. And typically, this means that it's a short range correction. 
And you can also learn even more by basically uh, decomposing uh, the error into atom-centered contributions. So here, these are basically, uh, this is the glucose molecule, and this is the lowest <laughs> energy and the highest energy structure in the data set. And what I'm showing is basically I'm uh, computing the contribution of each atom to the energy difference between uh, PB and PM7, for instance. So you see that when you look at the semi-empirical method, uh, you know, the error might be not so large, uh, but actually it comes from a cancellation of uh, errors. So you have some atoms that are very much too stable and some atoms that are uh, too unstable. Uh, and this just balances out. But this is an indication of the fact that these semi-empirical methods are indeed semi-empirical. You know, you try to get the right uh, answer, but you don't necessarily get it for the right reasons. If you look at something like the difference between a hybrid and a GGA, you see that the, you know, the, that the discrepancies are much more uh, regular, and you see that there is a large error in particular associated with the, you know, the closing of the ring in the glucose molecule. So basically what you understand from here is that uh, exact exchange is very important to describe the energetic uh, of this uh, uh, ring opening process. And basically if you look, uh, it's much harder to find the clear cut uh, signals uh, when you look uh, at uh, uh, the couple cluster, the, the difference between uh, you know, a hybrid and a correlated method, uh, basically because these are complicated correlations that you cannot represent so easily in terms of atom-centered contributions. OK, now this sort of closes the uh, supervised machine learning section. Uh, I wanted to get uh, now, finally, to the dimensionality reduction uh, aspect. So, <coughs> Uh, all of these kernels that I've shown you can be used to machine learn can also be used to define a distance. And in general, I think that really distances are the most natural building blocks uh, to do these dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, and and I, I want, again, to start from a, a concrete example, classifying the structures of oligopeptide, or I mean, some, probably this community would call this a polypeptide. I mean, <laughs> the, the people working with proteins, uh, you know, uh, up to, uh, to 20, it's probably an oligopeptide. But anyway, so uh, you can take this molecule. You run a, a accelerated molecular dynamics run using an empirical force field. We really don't care about accuracy at this level. And what you observe is that this molecule can exist in a number of different forms. Uh, and these different forms, uh, I mean, um, biochemists have learned to uh, classify in terms of uh, alpha helix, uh, beta sheet, uh, random coil, so in terms of these local patterns. So for the moment, I mean, we are working on sort of uh, rediscovering this with data-driven techniques. Uh, but here I want to focus more on uh, how you can classify the overall set of, of, of angles that uh, uh, describe the state of the molecule. So first of all, uh, it would be a little bit suicidal to use as the input to represent the state of this chain uh, the coordinates of all the atoms. Right? Why? Well, because this is a polyalanine, uh, and basically it's a very, the backbone is relatively rigid, uh, and you really don't care about the orientation of the methyl groups. Uh, so Something which is reasonable uh, and uh, I mean that I strongly advise you to do is uh, to reduce uh, the dimensionality of your problem to the maximum level you can uh, using uh, some obvious considerations. So for a system like this, uh, it's really clear that just the backbone dihedral angles uh, are sufficient uh, to fully characterize the state of the backbone. I mean, there are algorithms uh, that, given the sequence of backbone angles, uh, build you uh, the extended structure of the protein. So really, all the information is encoded in those 24 numbers. Now, the problem is that each structure, uh, even uh, if represented at this uh, simplified level, uh, consists of uh, 24 angles. So it's basically described by a vector of 24 numbers uh, 
Furthermore, living in a horribly complicated non-Euclidean space, because these are angles, so the geometry of the space is basically a hypertorus. So how can we understand something that lives in a 24-dimensional hypertoroidal space? That's the question. So my, the, the, the idea here is that each structure is a point in this space. And what you can do is measure the distance between these points. And this could be the Euclidean distance, as simple as that. And then, uh, in order to find a simple low-dimensional representation, what you can try to do is basically you know, set different reference points on a plane and just jiggle them around until all of the relative distances match the distances that you had computed in the high-dimensional space. If you succeed, this low-dimensional representation is going to be a faithful representation of the relative position of all of these reference structures. And once you have done this, uh, effectively, it's like you have uh, you know, a set of uh, reference points in the, uh, you know, the mind-boggling 24-dimensional uh, uh, space, uh, and a set of reference points in 2D that correspond to them. Uh, and you can use these uh, to build a continuous mapping uh, between the high and the low-dimensional space. Of course, uh, you know, this uh, operation of matching distances uh, would only work uh, literally if the high dimensional points happen to lie on uh, a hyperplane, which is, of course, a very strong assumption, uh, particularly if your space uh, is highly non Euclidean. So, um, the technique that we chose to use to solve this. Uh, problem, uh, we, which we call sketch map, basically starts from uh, something which is called multidimensional scaling, uh, which basically tries literally to do what I just described. So you define an objective function that tells you how much the distances uh, mismatch between the high and the low dimensional space. And you jiggle around this point until you uh, achieve the best possible match. And what we did in order to make the technique uh, suitable for atomistic data was basically to say, OK, you know, the problem is that these distances at low, small distances will correspond to stuff we don't care about, uh, thermal fluctuations, uh, small uh, molecular rearrangements. Uh, and if two things are completely unrelated to each other, we don't care about uh, representing accurately their distance. So what we do is we transform the distances so that we focus on the intermediate range that give us information on structures that are kinetically related to each other. And actually, if you apply this to what we originally envisioned this for, which was biochemical uh, simulations, you find that so if you describe the folding landscape of this oligopeptide using conventional order parameters, you find that the alpha helix is very stable. And then it looks like there is a, you know, the unfolded ensemble, so a bunch of structures that are all unstable. But actually, if you run a simulation and, and you start from a random coil, it all often gets stuck into structures that look stable and they stay stable for uh, hundreds of nanoseconds. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that it's not that these structures are not stable. It's that these coordinates cannot, uh, do not have enough resolution to distinguish this structure from that structure. And if instead you use a data-driven technique to, this, to define the collective variables, now each of these structures is correctly identified as a local free energy minimum. Now, how can you use these to attack big data, and I would put big in, in inverted commas because we are speaking here of a few thousand structures. Uh, how can you use these to tackle big data uh, databases? So um, this is, for instance, again, a data for, uh, from, from Karsten. It's a database of uh, uh, peptides and dipeptides um, in the gas phase. And uh, you know, for each structure, we have like uh, between 100 and uh, a couple of thousand conformers uh, that sample all of the, possi all the possible local minima in the uh, potential energy surface. So what you can do is you define distances between structures using this uh, uh, soap-based uh, kernel. Uh, 
And then you can, for instance, cluster these structures with a hierarchical clustering scheme. And, and you immediately find that actually, yes, you, know, you ha might have uh, a thousand structures, but actually they all partition quite naturally into a few groups uh, that differ, for instance, uh, for whether they are folded or extended, what kind of hydrogen bonds are present or not. And you find this, uh, you know, this uh, set of structures which is very separated from all the others. And then when you go and look at them, uh, you probably don't see it here, but uh, uh, basically, in this case, there has been a proton transfer going on, which is something that happened because Karsten ran, uh, I mean, Karsten and, uh, and his collaborator, Matt in particular, uh, ran these searches using DFT. So one of the downsides of using DFT is that unexpected things can happen, and you need uh, uh, these kind of uh, techniques uh, to recognize that something unexpected has happened. Otherwise, you might just go about uh, and uh, ignore the fact uh, that your search has found something interesting. And then, I mean, you can see that this clustering actually corresponds very well uh, to different structural parameters. Uh, and in particular, you find that the uh, backbone dihedrals are not the best variables to describe this data set, uh, again, uh, because having done the search with DFT and having included uh, fairly high energy structures, uh, also uh, the isomerization of the peptide bond is observed. Uh, this happens very rarely in a biological context. Uh, most peptide bonds are trans uh, in, in, in biological contexts. But uh, if you do your search, including high energy structures, also cis configurations can be found. You can also analyze this data set using SketchMap. Uh, and this is basically a you know, an alternative representation that rather than using this hierarchical clustering, uh, just does a two-dimensional map of the molecules. Uh, and you see, now you can identify very clearly these uh, structures that have undergone a chemical transformation. Uh, and you can see that all of the stable structures uh, are lying in this half of the plane. Uh, and these are structures in which uh, the, uh, you know, the side chain, which is positively charged, uh, folds and gets close uh, to the oxygen atoms. Now, if you add cations to this molecule, uh, you can see how the stability changes. And for instance, if you add a cation, uh, now the stable structures are almost all uh, those uh, with the open uh, side chain because the, cata uh, the, the, the cation is complexed by the, uh, the carbonyl uh, oxygens, uh, and, and, and then the other positive entity is pushed away. So for instance, if instead you look at the neutral amino acid, uh, there isn't such a clear cut distinction between stra stable and unstable structures. Uh, and if you look at the uncapped uh, peptide, uh, you see that the addition of the cation changes completely the conformational state of your molecule. So you can really use this representation to understand something and convey a message in a very clear manner. And something which is important, in my opinion, is that you can also use this kind of analysis to identify inconsistencies in the data set. So here, in particular, what we are doing is Looking at the, so for each of the clusters that we find, we have a measure of how structurally diverse they are and how energetically diverse they are. Now, you don't expect this correlation to be perfect because you can have stru structures that are very different but very similar in energy. But normally, you would expect to find something that shows some degree of correlation. For some of the structures in the database, uh, you were observing a correlation plot that was looking like this. So this is basically telling you that you have uh, clusters that are extremely similar, I mean, extremely homogeneous from the structural point of view, but have massively different energetics. Uh, and actually, this triggered uh, us and Carson to look back into the data and find that some of the structures uh, had uh, some uh, of the structures had been computed at a dif uh, different levels of theory. And these kind of discrepancies uh, would make machine learning completely pointless, because the, your database would contain uh, co uh, you know, contradictory data. The say effectively, the same structure uh, would be tagged uh, as having two very different energies. So this kind of automated analysis, I believe, would be extremely important uh, as you know, uh, 
databases of structures, perhaps of heterogeneous provenance, are combined together, it's extremely important to make sure that they are consistent. So as a final example uh, that I want to show you, um, this is still work in progress, but basically we're trying to apply this technique that we have sort of, uh, this far I really have only shown you applications to gas phase molecules, so we are starting to go to molecules uh, and to materials in the condensed phase, and in particular we are looking at molecular materials. Uh, and uh, so here we have uh, a few hundred uh, actually polymorphs from the group of Gramidae um, for uh, substituted pentacenes uh, uh, molecules. And we have in particular pentacene and two different uh, azapentacene molecules. Now this is meant to form very regular structures. You see it as a regular uh, nitrogen substitution pattern. And this instead uh, is meant to be Uh, giving rise to very disordered structures because it cannot form uh, a regular stacking uh, of the planes. So what you can see is that basically machine learning works beautifully. In all cases, so we can uh, easily get errors below a kilocalorie per mole. So this is really useful also if you want to do crystal structure prediction. You can use this kind of techniques uh, to predict energies at the DFT level uh, without having to run a DFT calculation. But what is also very interesting, again, is the kind of uh, insight that you can extract. So for instance, uh, uh, the PhD student, uh, Jackie, in the, in the group of uh, Gramidae, had uh, painfully looked at all of the 200 structures uh, and classified them manually in different uh, heuristic classes. You know, these molecular crystals can stack in different ways. Basically, just by automatically analyzing the database, we can find clusters that in some case correspond to the heuristic classification. And in some case, disclose very clear patterns that are not captured by the traditional techniques. And this also works very well for the regularly substituted pentacene. Again, you know, There is a heuristic classification, but the automatic classification uh, recognizes that there are more precise patterns. Uh, and uh, uh, instead, uh, for the irregularly substituted pentacene, uh, you see that this uh, classification thing doesn't work. Uh, and this is just because this is a very glassy landscape uh, that escapes uh, uh, this definition. So I just uh, want to show you um, that sort of a live demo. So. Uh, we are in the process of basically working out uh, a web interface uh, in which you can upload your structures, uh, build uh, a sketch map of them. So for instance, this is a database of uh, about a thousand uh, uh, polymorph of uh, ice. And basically you click on a structure, it gets loaded up here, and you have a list of the properties of all the structures. Uh, we have something similar for you know, organic, inorganic perovskites. Uh, you just, you know, load up all of your uh, structures and then you, you can recognize that you have different uh, motifs. So actually these are the proper uh, perovskite uh, structure. You know, you see the octahedra and all of that. But if you do an extensive search, you can also find uh, structures with dif very different connectivity between the, you know, this is the, uh, what they call the delta phase. Uh, which is actually bad for, uh, for uh, um, photovoltaic properties, and so on and so forth. And basically, the, the objective is to make sure that you can upload your structures and get these automatically. So with this, I will wrap up because Carson is uh, standing up uh, threateningly. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>